Okay, so irrigation, how many are new to the area, you've never used drip irrigation? Because that's really what we're going to focus on. It can be a little tricky. So, new, but you've worked with drip irrigation before? Well, yeah, but uh, I'm putting in a whole backyard. Oh, gotcha. You're installing a brand new one. Yeah. Perfect. So we'll go over that. We'll, you'll want to take some notes on this because I'll give you some stats on what to go for, how far you can go, how many meters you can have, that kind of stuff. So just kind of quickly glance over that. So, uh, so you really want to separate your irrigation into systems. And this is kind of a challenge for you folks with brand new homes. They kind of give you one valve, and then you got to go water the entire landscape with one clock, one valve, one, and it's hard to get the irrigation right. So I've got a just just shy of a half an acre up at Eagle Bridge, North Slope on, on a hill. So I've kind of terraced the yard so I can garden more. Um, I've broken down the front yard has four different valves. I've got trees and shrubs on one valve. I've got the thyme lawn on a separate valve. So thyme lawns, I water that about once a week, something like that. I've got my container pots, uh, just, just my, we have lots of containers, uh, big containers, like lots of them. Uh, I don't want to hand water those. And so I rigged it up to actually have a drip emitter. I'll show you which emitter I use for that. Uh, but I have that on a separate emitter. And then I've got some raised beds that are up in the, kind of going to the front street. I've got that on a separate valve. So I've, I've broken it out so I can isolate each system and, and water them individually. Um, in the backyard, I've got exactly the same thing. I've got uh, two flower valves, so I've got lower lower property because it's a steep slope. I went, oh, I don't know about the pressure going downhill that far. It drops maybe 20, 30 feet. So I'll, I'll put all the water down, all the flowers down here on one valve, all of flowers up here in the raised beds on a separate valve, so I can break it up. All the pots on one valve, and then all the trees and shrubs on a separate. So, so I've got eight valves all together in my yard. I've got two clocks. One in the front, one in the back. No, actually, I've got one clock. I just changed it this spring, and I'm, I'm playing with satellite-fed moisture meter, digital app. I can tell you anything about my drip irrigation from my phone. You do not want this in your own yard yet. That's what I'm telling you, because it is complicated. I am high tech. I'm, I'm the guy that waits in line for the new you know, Google phone or whatever it is. I'm one of those early adopters. Um, so I early adopted these, these tech uh, uh, irrigations. So I tied the two valves, the two uh, systems together into one. So I ran another line up to the garage. And so it's all, all internet, Wi-Fi. There's, you don't even program it from the, from the valve. It's all done from your phone or from a desktop or someplace. So that's how I've gone. And it has been awkward. I've killed a few things adapting, learning how to use this thing. But I figure if I can learn how to do it, it settles down, they get rid of the glitches, and they patch it the way correctly. Well, then I can share with, with my customers in a year or two the correct way or the correct, I can advise them which clock to use, that kind of stuff. So that's the goal. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, so that's how I've got eight valves. They're all separated. I'm now playing with moisture sensors. So I, here in the nursery, I've actually got uh, moisture sensors in the buckets. You know, if a plant gets stressed out, it just doesn't recover. And so we're putting moisture sensors. You'll see these big blue, white. There's different kinds of sensors in the in the certain trees, and so it automatically triggers when to go on or off. And so we're playing with that kind of stuff here at the nursery and at my house. And it's, it seems to be working pretty well. It's settling down, but there's a learning curve that's pretty steep. So hopefully that'll settle down. For your clock, probably you got a basic four to 12 valve clock. Uh, it's probably mounted either outside the garage or inside the garage. And then in the ground, you'll see this cover. Uh, there's a, there's a, what we call a manifold. It's where they stack all the valves together. They wire this clock into, into the ground. Usually it's, it's subground, it's got door, door lid. It can be green or brown, typically, sometimes black. So you'll look for that, and that's where all your valves are. Right now, the best thing you can do to protect 
that manifold or those valves is take a piece of insulation and throw it on top of the valves to keep them from freezing. If we get a real harsh winter, we haven't seen one for about 10 or 12 years, but we can go sub-zero some years for about a week. It freezes the ground about that far, and then it thaws, it gets nice, and it's just the thaw kind of had, had, uh, it disappears. If we see that, you can actually have seen valves break. Uh, and so that, that manifold, you don't just replace the one valve, you replace the entire manifold when that happens. So you have to cut it out, start all over it, put it back in, it's quite expensive. So what I do myself is I'll put a piece of insulation into a trash bag, tie it up, and throw it on top of, uh, in that space above the door and the, and the valves. I just protect it that way. And I've never had a valve freeze ever. Also what I do, I'm a little bit early in another month, in November sometime, I'll buy the mulch, the potting soil, or the shredded bark, stuff I'm gonna use in the spring, I buy it in the fall. And then I'll take that bag, I don't use it yet, I just take it and I throw it on top of that valve box. And so now I've got this much soil with, with some insulation, I've never once, no matter how cold we get over the decades, I've never lost a valve, have any kind of breakage whatsoever. And that little trick works really well. And if you get the tan colored bags and turn it with the label upside down, you can't even see it in the yard. So it's kind of an easy trick that keeps you from having some, some issues in the spring. Because if you got to hire a plumber to come out and fix that, that's, that's, that's probably four or five hundred bucks to fix that whole thing. What about your piping from your box? Uh, sure. So, so the code says, so the Prescott code, or most of, most of the cities, the code is 18 inches down. You gotta bury the line. That's from the house where you stub out into your home plumbing to the valve box, I would say 18 inch. Once you get to the irrigation box, that, that manifold, you got all your drip line, this stuff coming out, this stuff does not break. It flexes. Um, I would suggest, my, my thought, there's different takes on this. Some folks go all in and they just, they have it all, uh, a schedule 40, three quarter inch pipe, it's rigid. I don't do that. I want to have easy repairs. Now, if you're in an area that's got heavy, uh, oh man, now you see I dropped, here's my irrigation box, it looks kind of cheesy. I think I, I think I took one of my wife's cleaning boxes and I said, this is not my irrigation box. All my parts are in this, been in it for years. And of course, I've been pulling all these parts out, I spilled it in the trunk of the car. I have hundreds of little parts. Dang it. And I've missed my cutters. Hey, can you oh, go I'll down, down and, and get one, one of those sure. orange cutters? Ken, that would be great. Thank you. And I'll show them how to put these together. What I do from that manifold box, as soon as I, I'll, I'll bury that in, in the ground about a foot. I want to be, I don't want to, I don't want my big old butt crack hanging up out of the air trying to fix all these parts. I want it pretty easy access for myself. Mainly it's for me. Um, I don't care about code at that point. I want easy repairs because there is some maintenance to this. You got to need to tune it up like you do a car. Uh, probably once a year you're turning, tuning up your irrigation system. Um, and so this stuff I'll quickly come off and I'll be just above the ground. I'll barely bury this. I want to have easy access. When I add a plant, I'm a gardener. When I want to add a tree or a shrub or a flower, I want to find this very easily. So I'll backtrack that uh, uh, spaghetti tubing to this, open it up, and then all of a sudden I can can add another uh, uh, drip emitter into this system. Also, if I do get gophers, pack rats, something happens, the grandkids trip over the spaghetti tubing and rip it out of the line, thank you, Ellen, appreciate that. Um, I can now get in there and repair it. So I don't worry about this freezing. I don't have this freeze. I might have, I'll show you the parts that sometimes do, but they're so easy to repair, it's so cheap, I, I'll, I'll risk having that freeze so that I can get to it easier. So main thing is I'm trying to get this, have access to this. So if you're going down 18 inch, you don't want to do that. No it's way. too deep. You want to go lower. Anybody here go down 18 inches? I've heard that over and over and over, yeah, I've heard that. And it's usually the engineers, uh, nurses, accountants, the detailed, I want an exact, they 
exact folks. So I'm more of an artist. Just go with flow. Uh, anyway, that's, that's what I do here. So this stuff, you'll want one of these. This is the greatest tool ever. You have to have one of these. Don't use scissors. Don't use pruners. Get one of these and keep it in your box. You just put it on there and you clip it right off and it cuts it. It's just real easy to use. Uh, the other ones are clumsy and they, the cut is not as clean. So this is just a, a pipe cutter is all it is for drip systems. Okay. These things, you, have, you take no glue. They're just, uh, you just push them in. And then I defy even Superman to get this out of there. Oh, maybe, hold on. I'm Superman today. You push it in, I didn't push it far enough. Push it in, and then uh, it just locks on. And it's barbed, and you can barely get it off. I mean, it is tough. Um, this is half inch tubing, is how it's defined, or the main distribution line. This is what you come out of your valve and go out through the yard. You can have up to, this is where you want to take notes, 500 feet of this on one valve. You can do most of your yard with one 500 foot roll. Some, there are some variables, that's what the book says. I found that it's a little bit shorter if you're on a steep hill. Um, the gravity down below is so is much higher than at the top of the hill. I can't go quite 500 feet. I won't have enough pressure left at the top of the hill. So if you're on real heavy grades, that can vary a touch. You can also have up to, I mean, three, four hundred emitters on one, one valve. It's almost unlimited how many emitters you can have on one valve. Okay, so so that I wouldn't even I wouldn't even calculate that. It's not like a lawn system where you've got to have so much pressure, so many pop-ups, and each pop-up takes so much PSI. There's none of that because this is so low volume that you've got enough pressure to go around the entire yard. Okay, so with that, so this is a distribution line. You take this stuff. This is just my excess. I always have some laying around the garage. I just pull it out of the garage. This is my own stuff. You just run this out as far as you need to go. Run it down the fence line. If it's a place where I don't have to bury it, I don't bury it. So if I've got a, a hedgerow, a rose, climbing roses, if I've got uh, 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 screening plants, big spruce trees down the back of the property line, if I don't have to bury it, first of all, I'm lazy. Secondly, I really want access to it very easily. I want to be able to repair it quickly. I want to see where the problems are, get in there, cut it out, put, it, put a valve, put a, a coupler, and fix, just like that. And so you will have some maintenance. This is not once and done stuff. Uh, because there's no tape, there's no glue, you're just sticking it together. Uh, and then it is more exposed because it's up a little, it's up easier to access. Uh, you can get some gopher, pack rat, voles. You can have some rodents, basically, or what go after it. Sometimes javelina will nibble on this or dig around trying to find it and nibble on it for the water. Especially if it's really dry in the spring, you'll find those, those a little more damage then than there is during the monsoons. So just get it where it's easy to, easy to repair. Okay? Uh, the irrigation tubing that we use, we go after a higher grade, I mean, we're a higher grade place. People shop for us for quality. That's, that's our niche in the marketplace. And so we, we actually searched out, our parts have more UV stabilization. So you can leave that out exposed in the sun and it won't break, crack, and cause issues. I mean, for 10, 12, for a lot of years, some, ver some uh, things sold, how do I do this delicately? The box stores take shortcuts. They're using a lower grade uh, uh, poly UV stabilization. And you also find, this is the contractor grade, this is the contractor, this is what the contractors use. Um, sometimes you'll find, it's all called half inch, but there's actually a 0 0.52, 0 0.62, 0 0.64, 0 0.72. There's different sizes of half inch, but they're all defined as half inch. <laughs> It's crazy, but they're trying to they're trying to save a couple nickels to, to to size it down so they can sell it to you as a half inch, 500 foot roll for 39.99. But it's 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 uh, may not fit your system. That's important if you're retrofitting, if you're adding to your system. If it's a brand new system, probably doesn't matter as much. But if you're trying to add another 50 foot to add a row of of pampas grass to screen out your neighbors 
Class A RV they just bought, uh, or their garden shed where stuff's piling up or soften the fence lines. Um, there you need to really know what kind of, uh, of, of size tubing that you actually have. So I'd actually clip a piece off and bring it in and really check it. Uh, what we've done, because we're not, we're not the place for adding whole new systems, we're the place for adding to your current system. That's what we're trying to do. That's our niche. I don't want to be a hardware store and have 80 feet of irrigation parts. We have four feet, we just pick the best stuff, and we've got parts to help you fix and add to your drip systems. That's, our, that's what we're trying to do here, okay? So with that, all of our parts here, this particular LT couplers, they're made to fit any size tubing you have. So it says 0 0.52, 0 0.64, whatever it is, it's got a, a diaphragm in there that, that collapses in on the on the on that tubing so you don't have to think as much you don't have to, you don't have to blunder your way through and go dang it wrong size go back to the store again we're trying to save trips and make it easier uh, and also these are the parts that we use on the truck so if we're planting for you and you want us to add to your this new tree or shrub or whatever to your system we don't want to be going labor is expensive we can't afford to run down the hardware store irrigation shop and figure out which one is right for you. So we're trying to go one part, it's on the truck always, it will fit, adapt, go, and the guys are out there in you know, half an hour, just come and go. So that we're trying to be strategic for ourselves and also for, for our customers, okay? This is the main distribution line. After that, you'll also need one of these and get this one. Okay, they make all kinds of hole punches, uh, but this is the one that fits in your hand and actually uh, punches easier than uh, you just punch in a hole and just distribute. So you went out 100 feet to a new fruit tree, you know, two new cherries you just planted. Now you got to get the drip part from this main distribution line out to what we call the spaghetti tubing. So there we've got, this is called spaghetti tubing because it looks like spaghetti. And from there, let me see if I pull my parts here. You see how clumsy I am here. Yeah, look at that, I did good. Uh, there you've got a, a, a coupler. Should bring one too? Let's see. So this is a coupler, just you just uh, simply throw that on. Again, no glue or anything. So that this just gets you access, allows you to get the spaghetti tube into this hole you just punched. All of a sudden you're in, you run this. You're getting this within 10 feet or so of your plant. You can go, I found you can go up to about 25 feet with a spaghetti tubing. After that, you lose enough pressure where you need to actually put a T in and take more of the distribution line, get it closer to your plant. But if you're within 25 feet, you can take this spaghetti tubing and run it out to that plant and be just fine. I've had up to, I'm actually stunned how many emitters I could have on the spaghetti tubing. It, it's surprising, it, and water still comes out. You'll know that you went too far when you turn the drip system on and water's coming out of this emitter, this emitter, this emitter, and at the end of the line, no water. Went, oh, oops, I don't have enough pressure to get the drips, the drips out of these emitters at the end. So then you need to actually take more distribution line and then run it over closer to that, that tree or shrub or rose garden, whatever it is. Okay. Get it close, basically, and then you can go to this. It's pretty forgiving. From here, you'll take your drip, your drip emitter, and this is two gallons per hour. The system has to run for an hour, and you'll actually have two gallons of water if it's been running for an hour. This is really difficult for my Southern Cal folks that are used to shrub or, or uh, older Phoenix era folks, used to flood irrigation or bubblers, flooding kind of, of irrigation. There you run your systems for 15 minutes and you've got this much water sitting on the, on the flower bed or on that, on that part of the garden. We don't do that here because you, you're, it's not very efficient. You get more evaporation, you're not as strategic with where the water goes, you're just kind of slopping it around. Uh, you do that kind of irrigation where, water, where your water bill is very cheap. You can just kind of slop it around, ah, it's, it's, I got enough money to double down on that. Here we don't. The, the, the bill is, is more expensive here. So you want to be more strategic. Um, so here we take this emitter, we plug, plug it in, 
and you kind of get it close to the, the, the root ball. So you kind of throw it right in there. Get it close to the root ball. You got a brand new plant, like this is a cotonia, this is a native, our native cotonia aster. Here I would add this to my tree and shrub valve. I would take an emitter and I would put it probably just one for, for a five gallon plant, maybe two, if it's a tree or something. And I would water this native, even a native I would water for a year until it gets rooted out. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll bend this over and tape it. And for my, for my head, I'm, I'm a gardener, I like to nurture plants. I want to bend it over so I could have access to it later if I wanted and unbend it and have it back out. But a native should only need irrigation for a year. Then at that point, the roots are out far enough, it can go by itself. Um, I have never once with my natives undone one of these. It's just for my, it's for my peace of mind. I could go help it if it needed help, but the plant never needs help because it's a native. For my more uh, uh, ornamental plants, I'll keep that on there, uh, especially bigger trees. Let's say I've got a big maple or an aspen grove or lots of ornamental grasses. There I might actually, um, two, three years later, I might actually clip that off. Then I'll add a T to that plant to get rid of some of these parts so I can see stuff. They make a spaghetti tubing T. Just give Bell a, 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 a emitter here, here, and here. So with this, what I do is, because the plant's grown and the roots are getting uh, larger, and I've got that first emitter for the year or two right at the, right at the base, well, now the roots are way out here. And what's at the base is big, big uh, anchoring roots. They don't actually take in any amount of water. They're just there to keep the tree upright. That's it. They are unable to take in food or water. And so what I'll do is I'll just modify this. I don't change my valves or anything. I just modify. And this is how I do it. I kind of get it prepped. So I get it all right. I'll make a circle. And I cut the circle in two. So I get it the right spacing. Just some quick shortcuts. And then I'll take my, remember this is my main distribution line, coming out this way. This is where the emitter was. So I just snipped off that last emitter and I'm putting on this new emitter and I'm adding two instead of one. And you can add two or three or four and now I can add emitters. Do I have enough? Let's see here. I'll take this one. Now all of a sudden, with the same irrigation line coming out, get that where you can see it. Come on, behave. Now all of a sudden, where I had one emitter right here, now I can come out and now I've got two emitters. That's a game changer. You've got a house where you're modifying, uh, you need to actually increase the health or, or the trees have just doubled, tripled in size. You need to do this and maintain the system or maintain your plants and increase the water because as a tree or shrub is bigger, it's going to need more water to keep it healthy and to keep it going. And then do you just keep that around the drip line of the tree? I keep it at the drip line. Yeah. And what I do is I'll try to modify. I, I don't try to lead the roots. I try to just keep the roots that are there healthy. So that she, she, she said the drip line. Imagine I'm the trunk of the tree going up and I have branches going out. So this is the drip line. Underneath those branches, that's defined as the drip line. So what I'll try to do is take my emitters to be about halfway or so, or where it's comfortable, I'll kind of go there. That's close enough, okay? And how so, big trip? Yeah, what's that? How deep those wires go? Oh, I how keep these, I barely scratch these in the ground. I mean, I barely, sometimes I don't put them in the ground at all. I'll just bury them and put a rock on it. Yeah. I want easy access so that I can do this kind of stuff whenever I want. So if a pack rat comes and eats this, or uh, uh, an earwig comes and lays eggs inside yeah. this uh, emitter and clogs it, a snail or slug, they seem to like to clog this up and lay eggs inside this because it's moist and dark. And so sometimes you'll need to walk through in the spring mainly, turn your system on, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll run it for a full cycle. And then sometimes I'll start to see a wet spot. But usually I'll run it a second time. I'll run my, I'll double down on the cycle in spring. And now I've got a defined wet spot where I can see where my emitters are. 
And then I'll just walk the yard and I'll scrape over the old leaf litter or needles that have dropped or think whatever's there, I've top dressed with mulch or, or, or whatever. By then I can start to seize a wet spot, even if this is buried an inch or two under the ground, I can still see where it was. So now I can go, oh, there's no water, there's not one wet spot underneath this camellia? What's going on? Oh, something's happening. And uh, so then I can go and maintain it. So I'll do that every spring. Um, questions on emitters. I do like two gallon per hour emitters. Let's just cover that real quick. You'll see lots of choices with emitters. Let me just tell you what, what I use and what we sell and why we sell it here. We've really chosen which ones are best. Again, we're, if we're coming out, our planting crews are out every day. They're roaming around. If you're in the mid, if you're 15 miles out Williamson Valley, and you're going to plant a, a hedgerow of something in, in, in Talking Rock, you cannot afford to have a team of people with trucks and all that gear to come into town, get your stuff, go back out. They have to have the stuff on the truck to make it go right now. And so we've chosen these emitters because they're pressure compensated. What that means is, if you've got any grade at all, at the low part of the hill, the pressure will be much higher. Hydraulics, we're talking about physics here. Uh, but the, the weight of the water is much heavier at the bottom of the hill than at the top of the hill. So if you've got a, an emitter that is not pressure compensated, what will happen is at the bottom of the hill will flow, it says two gallons per hour, but it's really flowing at six, seven, eight, ten 10 gallons per hour because the pressure is just so high, it's forcing that water out of that emitter faster. At the top of the hill, you don't even have, probably don't even have two or three pounds per square inch. It's, it's barely dripping, so you don't have an even flow. You do want to use a for new system, use pressure compensating emitters or button emitters. Uh, the other benefit with these emitters is as the water goes in, the way it spins around, it, it cleans it out more. So it, it spins out, you'll have insects really like to get into these. So it's a self-cleaning, pressure compensating emitter. We've got them at half gallon, one gallon, and two gallons down there. You'll see them as high as four, four gallons sometimes, maybe even a little bit higher. Uh, really, two gallon I find, it's just personal experience, it's just, just me. Um, I like two gallon per hour because they don't clog as easy. I have less maintenance with a two gallon per hour emitter head than I do with a one or a half gallon. A lot of folks try to overanalyze it against my really technical brainiac, very heady folks. They like to go half gallons for small plants, and one gallons, or they like to really play with it. I, I just go eh, two gallon per hour. I got one emitter for trees and shrubs. That's what I do, and I, I play with how many emitters I'm going to put on each plant that I'm, at, I'm adding out there. So typically trees, I'll put two either side of the root ball for a one or five gallon, two gallon smaller plant. Generally, I just put one at the base of the plant and I call it all good. Now I'm going to run that system. Again, this has got to run for an hour just to get two gallons of water. If you've got a five gallon plant, this will probably need about five gallons of water per week during the growing season. So if I do that, I only put one emitter, I'm going to have to leave that system on for how long to get five gallons on there? Oh, two and a half hours. Or an hour and a half. If I've got two, yeah, or, or an hour and a half twice a week. Yep, you can vary it up that way. So you're, you're looking at a 15, thank you, Ken. On the back of my card, we'll cover that in a second. On the, um, for a 15 gallon plant, you need about 15 gallons of water per week. For a one gallon plant, you need about one gallon per water a week. For a two gallon plant, guess how much you need? <laughs> about two gallons. It's a real, we're trying to simplify these, make it easy, so you can do the math real quick. Uh, this is difficult for <laughs> my, my Northwest folks. Oh, you poor people. Oh, poor, poor folks from Seattle, Portland. Oh, it rains all the time, I shouldn't have to ever water. Well, yeah, you've got to water now. Yeah, you've got to do that. And when it rained this year, we had more rain than ever. Yeah, it was all at once, though. It wasn't over the whole year. You got, you got to, you got to fill in the gaps. Um, Midwest folks, they never water ever. They never watered. They just plant it and it goes, and nature just takes care of it. It's all fine. And then my my uh, Phoenix Phoenix folks, they are heavy clay soil. Uh, it's just harder for them to adapt to the to mountains. Just you got to think local, and how the mountains are working. Our systems are, are coming on usually the end of April, 
May. That's when our last frost date is. I typically turn my system on where I'm modifying it to add more water. I'm watering at the regular growing. My growing season starts in April through October, middle of November. That's our growing season here at this altitude, okay? Your little higher altitude, you know, Highland Pines or Groom Creek or something, maybe it's a little bit shorter, but we're only talking a week. Maybe it's May to middle of October. We're basically the same. Um, if you're real low elevation, coming in from Cottonwood or Camp Verde or the or Kirkland, Skull Valley, this 4,000 foot level, maybe it's a little bit longer. But we're all basically, we're zone seven. With a frost date of Mother's Day is our first, our, our last frost. And Halloween is our first frost. If you think of those holidays, that'll help you go, oh, when do I have to think about this freezing? When do I have to maintain that? When do I have to turn it on? When do I have to think the plants are actively growing and I need to give, nurture them a little bit more? Okay. In the winter, we're going to water. In the summer, we're going to water. In the spring, we're watering 12 months out of the year at this elevation. We're such a mild climate. Even in January, you should be watering. I can't emphasize this enough. It's hard to believe. I understand. But we just don't freeze. Last year, we had a lot of kill-off. Lots of people lost plants. Now, that's good for my family because I'm putting the kids through grad school. They had to replace the plants. <laughs> But for my, for my friends, I don't want that for you all. I want you to have healthy plants that you because you know what to do. So if they had watered a couple times a month through winter, that's enough to keep plants healthy. You just want to keep that water in the structure of that plant. It's hibernating, but the antifreeze that's naturally occurring inside, let's say this, this ketoniaster. This has a lot of antifreeze in it. It'll go down to minus 40 degrees. Crazy man cold, evergreen. It has white flowers, red berries. It's a great plant for it. Naturalizes. Um, it's related to our native one, only this one gets big. If you want to screen your neighbors, if they scream too much, the kids are like, out. Oh. Right? If they got, I don't know, whatever they're doing out there, you don't want to see. You got a brand new hot tub. You want your neighbors to go away so you can dip however you want. This is the plant. This is the one you want. It gets up like this tall, like this wide, solid evergreen. If you don't water this in the winter, the antifreeze, it naturally keeps it where it can go down to minus 40, will, will start to fade back to the heart of the plant. So it'll, it'll actually sacrifice the tips to keep the core or the, the heart of the plant alive. So we call that winter burn or winter kill. So the plant was dry when we got a real dip and so it, it kills off the top. If it gets bad enough, last year we didn't have rain from November through June. That is a long time, and it was a warm winter. We have never seen it that warm, if, if winter can be warm. I mean, it was warmer than normal. So plants didn't shut down, and it had no naturally occurring moisture. Those folks that didn't water some of their landscape, they lost entire portions of their landscape because it was dry, just winter kill. If they had simply watered a couple times a month, they would have had no kill. The plants would have flushed out in spring and been beautiful. So that's one little thing. If, if you got a whole lot of plants and you just don't want to turn your drip system on in winter, water them by hand. Just go out on a nice day, even in January after a storm. It's going to be nice. The next week it's going to be bright and sunny and warm. Just go out and water them. Okay, that's the thing I can tell you. So water our growing season. Now you want to look on the back of that, that house plant, the, the, the business card. You'll see growing season and winter watering on the back of that card. And that's made to actually tape inside your irrigation box as a help. When do I turn the system on? When do I modify? When do I adjust, adjust my clock? So you're watering April through October at about once a week for established plants. You established new plantings, their root structure just smaller. So you, you want to water those about twice a week, okay? What I tell folks is if you've got a whole lot of established plants out there, um, set the clock up for the established plants. So water them once a week. And then go out and water by hand once, and add to that new plant you put out there, water it by hand once. So that, that's kind of a little trick that you, 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 you can, can adapt a, a fully mature landscape with a few new plants, water by hand. Makes, makes it easier. Question. This 10-year-old 
butterfly bush need to be watered? Ten-year-old butterfly bush doesn't need to be watered, yes. Huh? If you want it to bloom okay. and be pretty. Okay. If you want it to be mangy, kind of native looking, probably not as much. And I would say you need to fertilize uh, that. If you want it's, uh, anything that blooms, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of food to create that flower, especially a lot of them. Uh, and I think the butterfly bush can become too big, too woody. Needs to be cut back every once in a while. Yeah, I, I would keep it on the. I would treat it like a tree or a shrub. That's how I would treat butterfly bush. Lilacs, forsythia, quince, all those bloomers. I would treat them like a, a tree or a shrub. Don't put them on their own system. I just treat them like every other big, deep-rooted plant out in the yard. Yeah. What about watering uh, fruit trees, like four to six-inch fruit trees that are two to three years old? Nice. That's good. True. Once a week. So establish plant once a week. Here's the secret though, you need to water them once a week, but you don't want to just cycle. I see too many new folks coming in where they're watering 15 minutes every day. And so you see this play out in the, when the monsoons hit, uh, you'll literally see trees blow over because the roots are so shallow and so few. Or when the fruit trees load up with fruit, they're leaning a little bit, they've been watered very frequently, but not very much you'll see the tree actually fall out of the ground. It'll literally fall over and the roots pop out of the ground because the roots were never trained to go deep. When you're training your plants, you can train them how deep to be more hardier. You just have to force that water come out of this, push it deeper into the ground, and so the roots follow the water and go deeper in the ground. Right. If you're watering 15 minutes a day and it's a one gallon per hour emitter, it's like a quart a day. It's not very much water for a tree or a shrub. It's hardly enough water for a, for a flower, a little tiny rooted thing. So you need to actually run that system probably more for like an hour, two hours at a time to push that water down deep enough so the roots are deep. If it's real shallow, you'll, you'll water that, deep, that uh, dripping mineral will, will penetrate the soil about that much. And so all your roots will be just barely underneath the ground. And so that's when you get issues with drought, wind, fruit, fruit harvest, that kind of stuff. How many okay. gallons of water does a, a, a fruit tree need? Try to think in terms of, yeah, I don't know. No one can tell you. Okay. You've got to kind of do that gardener thing and kind of okay. guesstimate. Okay. I would say you need at least two emitters or at least do this to three emitters. He's got bigger fruit trees. He's three, four inches like this big. So that's good. They're, that's a good producing size too. I'd probably take two emitters to three emitters and I'd run it two, three hours, probably a couple hours, something like that. That would be a, a healthy uh, uh, amount of water for that, for, for fruit two trees. Two gallon? Two gallon. I like two gallon. Everything in my yard is two gallon per hour. Everything. Just because I don't want to maintain them. I just, all my trees and shrubs are on this. For my containers, I have a special, here's my box. For my containers, I use this one. This is the greatest emitter ever. If you've got raised beds, big pots, I grow a lot of trees, shrubs, my tomatoes are grown in pots, great big glazed pots. I like this one. This one actually is used. You come off your distribution line, so this main line, punch into that, I'll come out to the pot, and then I'll, I'll actually it goes on this, this uh, barb right there, and then I poke it in the middle of the, of the uh, pot, so I'll just poke it. It's not a good example. Basically, it's got a spike on it, so it doesn't move. And it's got an adjustable head from one to 10 gallons per hour. So now I can adjust the bell of the shape of that water flow to the size of the pot. So I just adjust it down to whatever size pot that is. And then I go, hey, I'm watering my containers. It's a great one. I would never use this out in the yard. I sell most of these, most of this variety. This is the same exact head as this only without the steak, you put your emitter, you put your spaghetti tubing right there. I sell a lot of these to folks where they, they start adding them into their landscape. And so as soon as you put this on your, your system, it's not pressure compensated. So you start to lose your PSI, the low part of the hill, the high part of the hill. And then as soon as you open it up, you screw up the PSI even more. So you can never regulate how much water is coming out over the whole system. You lose all the consistency. You do, you can't put a lot of water flow on a tree that needs, that needs more water. But I would rather do that tea 
I'd rather come off like this so I can keep the consistency. I know I'm going to get the same amount of water at the bottom of the hill, the top of the hill, along the run. Also, another uh, Swanamon School of Hard Knocks, another one is never ever go up and down the hill with your, with your uh, main distribution line. This stuff, don't go up and down like this. I made that mistake. You want to go sideways like this. So at the top of the hill, bottom of the hill. So, some of you aren't on hills, it doesn't matter, but a lot of us are. We're in a mountain town. So if you run it up and down, this way up and down the hill, you can never get that pressure right. It just really screws up the PSI coming across the, the irrigation. Because to go across, horizontally across the hill, just trust me, it'll save you a lot of headaches. And, and modifying the entire system back to this way. Yes. So Nancy has a question online. Yeah. Hey, she, Nancy. she says, can you run a drip system if you have a well? My concern would be the pump for running so long. Yeah, well, okay, so wells. Yes, I've had a lot of wells, a lot of properties with wells. Yes, you can do drip system. It's actually more efficient to run drip systems with wells because the water flow is so low. You're typically going to run these systems at 15 to 20 pounds per square inch, so you actually got to reduce the pressure. Now, you're not running them at 35, 40, 50 pounds per, per square inch like you are your house pressure. So your house, when you turn on that faucet, typically it's 35 to 50 pounds per square inch. We need to get that lower for for irrigate for drip irrigation or micro irrigation. You want to lower that down to anywhere from 10 to 30 pounds per square inch. That's the reason we don't have to use tape. We don't have to use glue. We can just poke it all together because it's at low pressure. So if it's at low pressure and you're coming off a drip system on a well, you hardly have any kind of flow. So your booster pump and your pressure tank will easily, and you've got both of those in your well house, your booster tank and that pressure pump will easily handle a drip system without even, without even trying. Uh, some of you are on really old properties and the wells used to be really shallow. I mean, it used to be expensive to drill wells and we'd take shortcuts whenever you can. Like the well here on the property is, I think only 100 feet, it's really shallow. But we're on, this is a Iron Springs Road for a reason. Every time you dig a hole, water starts flowing up out of it. It's like crazy. Like this building is on special floating footers, helical piers, because it's, I literally right here sank a grader, huge grader. He started to disappear under the ground because he hit the groundwater and just we had to have a, a track hoe pull him out and then relay no more footers. So the water table is really high right here. So when it rains, it goes up to about 10 feet. So we've got water all the time, pretty easy to get to. But some of you, like Granite, Granite Mountain, hear everyone whining about, my well's drying out, oh, my well's drying. Those are old properties where they took shortcuts and never drilled the hole any deeper. You can't deal with a 50-foot well and then have buildings everywhere. It's, it's, that's old school thinking. So anymore, they're digging wells hundreds of feet. In Chino Valley, they're going down to the second. There's two uh, uh, water basins there. There's the, the, the big Chino and the the bigger Chino, whatever. But at, at uh, several hundred feet, it's almost a lake of water underneath there. If you're in the upper upper well, upper water basin, it's, 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 you can run dry. So drip system's a way to go if you're doing that, because it's much, much more efficient. If you're on city water, you've got expensive water. So there, you, you'll pay for this drip system. Within a year, you're paying for it just because your water bill goes down so much that you're, you're now have nice yards and you can afford to do it. So yes, wells are good. Uh, okay, now I derail, where am I at? Let's see, refocus, refocus, oh. So I mentioned that some of my parts can freeze in the winter. Here's where I find the issues. I'll just share them with you. I seem to have issues with L's. When I'm, when I'm L'ing, sometimes the water will settle right there in that L um, and it can crack. So in the spring, when I turn the system back on, I go, oops, I lost one. Well, for two, three, four bucks, I can go click, click, slip it on, and it's fixed. So that's another reason you want this to be where you can see it. You, if it does actually freeze and break, it's rare when that happens, but that I've seen it every once in a while. Just, just be aware, look for your elbows. Sometimes T's, not usually, usually a T's got a much when the water freezes. It's got enough expansion where it can can diffuse that pressure. So as ice forms, it actually water expands. 
as that expansion hits, it gets in there, it expands, and it adds, it cracks the pipe. That's how it works. So as the water freezes, it can break a, break a tube. I've never had it break this. This, I mainly have problems with vermin. Uh, javelina to, to gophers to pet rats, mainly. So there you want access to it so you can, can click it. Really what it is, my main nemesis with this stuff is me. As you go in with a shovel, you go, Hook. Oh, I thought it was over there. I like, went right through it. And you go, oh my gosh, I, gotta, I always have couplers. You will always need, you always want some of, I've used the ball. I've had enough breaks. Oh, there it is. I always have extra couplers, always. Because if, if you're a gardener at all, you're going to go through the line every once in a while. It's okay. Super easy. It takes about five minutes. If the line is easy to access, you open it up, you clip it off about here and here, you got about that much gap. So you got room to, to wiggle, slip it on, and away you go. It's fixed, just like that. No blue, no tape. It's easy. It's an easy fix. Okay, so always have, it's okay to have a bucket of extra parts. You'll want these for the maintenance in the spring, okay? Do you have any tricks for keeping the dirt out while you're doing the Keeping the dirt out? Well, don't have dirt in it. <laughs> oh, yeah. The only, so her question was, how do I keep dirt out of the repair? Um, Let's just cover that. That's a good point. Generally, I try to dig back a little bit further so I get a little more room to maneuver. That means you got to move a little more rock, a little more to free up the space. That's the only true way to clip it off and get it in together. It also gives you more elbow room to kind of maneuver things. Uh, if I do get a lot of dirt in it, I'll, I usually have a, 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 an end cap, a figure eight end cap at the end. Oh, that. I really should have gone through the bins and gotten them out of there so I knew what I had. Oh, oh yeah, very good. Good eye, man, yeah. And I've got, I've got a lot of these. And so there, I'll, if I get dirt back here, I've made a repair, I'll open it up and I'll just run the system and flush all that stuff out. Actually, you should probably flush your system out every year, probably every year, uh, because it's amazing how much grit is in the water. It's amazing how much stuff, it's actually frightening. When you drink a glass of tap water, you know, oh, this is good. And then you'll see how much stuff is in the tap water for a, with a year's worth of irrigation. There'll be stuff clogged up. If you've got emitters, this is how this is how you, you clog the ends, so you get pressure. You just take it, bend it over, you take this figure eight thing, you just, just uh, there, it's, it's now pinched. So it can't, it can't flow. It makes it easy to maintain it down the road to clean it out. Um, if you've got an emitter right here towards the end, sometimes it can clog up just because there's so much gunk at the end that uh, it plugs up that emitter. So it's some maintenance at the end of the line. So generally I'll leave these up where I can see them. I'll try to deadhead this behind a bush or something where I can easily spot it later because I know I'm going to want to maintain this. So I'll just leave it real where it's really easy to find. It's kind of ugly, I realize. That's why it's back there. Sometimes I'll throw a rock on it and I'll try to remember where the rock was. So you get into that and I know it's here somewhere. Doc, got it. Where is it? Okay, okay, boom. And you open it up. So just some things you'll find that kind of help you extend the system. That's that. One. That's what works. Okay. But also my valve here. This, we do make this manifold. I put these together years ago. I've been selling these for, for decades. Um, this is for folks that travel a lot and they just want an extra valve on their back patio, their deck. They don't want it tied into their whole big system. They just want an extra thing where they, this goes onto a hose bin on the outside of your house. This is a battery operated clock. And then it's got a pressure reducing valve and a filter. You do want a pressure reducing valve, that's what it's called, to reduce the pressure from house pressure down to working pressure for this. This happens to be 30 PSI. So that's a, that would be the maximum I would go with, okay? Then it's also got the stainless steel filter. So you do want a filter on your system, definitely. Don't try to take shortcuts. It's like a $15 part, you'll want it on the system. Here, because I was trying to make it easy for my customers, and keep it short, I actually found a part that has the filter and the PSI pressure reducing valve
combined. So I just reduced the length of this by you know, this much. So I combine the two. Um, and then I've got this adapter that has your main line, this, this main, main half inch line. So it's going out wherever you want it to go. Around the front patio to put pots on or whatever. Okay. Um, main thing, main point with this is have a filter. If you don't, emitters will start clogging up and failing you and they'll fail in summer. You go, I don't know what's going on. My plants just died. I did everything you told me to do. But the grit clogged up the emitters. And then if the pressure is too high, they'll start blowing off emitters. So it'll just it'll actually push them right off. Or they'll flow at much higher rates than they're rated for. So you're watering too much. So reduce the pressure filter. That's why I brought this. Okay. Uh, this is how spaghetti tubing comes. Just get a 100-foot roll. You'll, just, you'll use it up. It's amazing how much of the stuff you use. Yeah. Just get a big roll. And then this is how I'll water some of my, like my strawberry patch. I'll use this. This is spaghetti tubing. But what they've done is every foot, they've got this little bubble right here. They've embedded a, a, an emitter right there. So you've got a one gallon per hour emitter at one foot spacing. So if you snake this through your uh, uh, vegetable bag, a strawberry patch, I've used this around the base of trees where I want to, um, instead of teeing off and do all these parts, I'll just take this. Or if I didn't have the parts in my bin, I'll just go, hey, I got spaghetti tubing with, with I got soaker hose, what this is. I'll just run the length of that around the tree and all will be good. And so that works out pretty well. With this, you're actually taking a, uh, you're taking, this is really awkward. There we are. There we go. You're taking this. You're taking your main line, this main half inch line. You get it close to the bed. You poke your hole in it. Then you take your coupler. You poke it in there. You poke it into your main line. line and you run it or snake it through or run it through. I actually water my, my time lawn with this. I went through every three feet, I think, is what I did. And I buried this just underneath the ground. And then I, I have half inch line on, on the edge of the patio. And I took this stuff and I ran it to the end of that bed, that time lawn. And I buried it with about two inches of, of soil. And then I ran it. Wherever I saw a wet spot, I did a time plug. And that's how I got my time lawn going. So super efficient watering. Uh, and then super low maintenance. When the kids left for college, I went, I am not mowing again. Pull the lawn out. Let's face it, you're not playing soccer or baseball with the kids on the lawn anymore. You're now, it's now a patio. It's like a secluded uh, courtyard with time lawns, and containers, and running fountains. It's beautiful. We spend most of our afternoons there because it's so pretty. But I, I watered most of the time lawns with this. Trees and shrubs with drippy emitters, like I showed you before. So with this, I'll just run it out, pin it down, and at the very end, you'll need to, you'll need to put a plug in it, yeah, very good. Yeah, otherwise you don't get pressure. So each, they're one foot centers, so these old emitters are one foot. So you space it out that way. But at the very end of this, you need to plug it, either by pinching it like that, or, um, You'll need some of these, it's called a goof plug. It's just a plug, it just plugs up a quarter inch line. Or they call it a goof plug, because when you actually accidentally pull this out of your half your main line, you go, oops, I goofed, you can plug it up. So it, it is quite effective. So every system needs at least about 20 or 30 of these as you goofed it up. It's just, you're gonna find that you're gonna need them. So just get a, just get a whole card of tin or whatever, because you're gonna use them. That's how you use drip soakers. I've done uh, rows of tomatoes. I've done my potatoes with these. Um, strawberry beds and time lawns what I'm doing now. So it's a great, great source for if you need a lot of emitters or a lot of spacing. And each emitter will make a wet spot about that big. Okay. Let it run. Okay. Yeah? Do you prefer that to the hose that's already porous and the whole hose? Like this stuff? Yeah. So this, well, the, this is... Like the spaghetti tubing too. Oh yeah, I do prefer. Yeah, that's right. So they make they grind up tires, and they make this porous uh, soaker hose. I don't like that. 
I don't find as much consistency if you're taking long runs. So at the front of it, it it's much wetter than at the end. I find I get much more consistent patterns of water. If you need, I can go up to about 25 feet with this and still have the same water coming out at the end of the, the, the thing as I could. I could never go more than maybe 10, 8, 10 feet with the porous stuff. Because I traded in my garden and it's like when you got to the end, it was like lining up. Oh, interesting. It didn't. You'll find things like that that happen. So part of this is School of Hard Knocks. I'm just sharing some stuff I've seen over the decades, my personal gardens. And we get the part, and the parts that are easier to use, just so you're not struggling as much trying to figure which, which parts to use. Okay? So, here we go. This is the easiest drip system ever. It's just soaker hose. This is drip irrigation. It comes in like this, where it has uh, the big round, uh, ground up tire kind of stuff, porch stuff. You can just snake that through and go, ah, turn on a hose bib and call them good. That's, that's a good way to go too. That's how I start uh, wildflower beds, that kind of stuff. I'll just use this going, I don't want it permanent. I just want temporary. I'll just take this and I'll throw it out, snake it through the, the, that wildflower patch. I'll turn it on. Wherever I see the wet spots, that's where I put my wildflower seeds. I'll water it for a year. Once it's done, I pull up the hose. I let the flowers go by themselves. That's a good, there's, some, there's different techniques, different ways to take care of different, different garden projects. Okay, we're down to the portion where we just do Q&A. Do we get it all? So 500 feet on one system. You can go, I've gone almost up to 500 emitters on one system. So it's amazing. Depends on the grade. Uh, use pressure compensated. Don't use flag emitters. Some of these easy, don't use adjustables. Um, except for on your container pots. Container pots, I do use that stake. The stake emitter I showed you, wherever that is. Anyway, I showed it to you already. Uh, anyway, where the thing you Here it is. I was doing an example with this. Use that for containers. It's the greatest one ever. I don't use it for trees and shrubs. What else? Freezing. Make sure it's easy access. You can maintain, maintain, maintain. Uh, here's one other last trick I use because uh, you've got, I've got four valves in the backyard, four in the front. It means I've got four, spaghetti, four main lines, four of these going in. Um, I don't bury these individually. I make a trench, and I'm lazy. I want shortcuts whenever possible. I trench my yard, which is a pain. That is back-breaking, grueling work. I trench it, and I throw all four lines in the, in the trench, and I bury them all at once. I them all together, so I know where they're at. Here's the secret. Which one, when you want to add a tree, a fruit tree, to your yard or a flower or a vegetable, which line is it? It's you scratch your head going, I don't know, and you make a mistake, and then you make a mistake. What I do is I'll spray paint the valve for the trees, some color, whatever I have in the garage, and I spray paint the entire line that color. So now I go, there's my tree valve. Look for red or blue or green or white or whatever color. And so I'll, I'll spray paint all of them a different color except for one. One I will leave black because I know, oh, the black one, that's, that's the flowers, that's the containers. So ID or mark this, and that paint, it seems to last for years and years and years underneath the ground. So I've had mine in for 10, 15 years, 12 years, I don't know how long. And it's still I go in and find which valve I want to I attach to. Again, I'm a gardener, I'm always adding new things to my gardens because I think that's fun. I also want to have one to own under that valve. This little trick that will probably help you a lot down the road. Okay, what else? Get underneath the feet back as a whale. Yeah. What about using those things that, that they have like the little tube that comes up and then... Sure, yeah. So she, there's, a, there's, there's all kinds. You'll be, you'll, you, you'll just be dizzy with confusion if you go up to the wall of irrigation and which one is right. They do make a commercial product where they come up out of, the, out of the ground, it's on a riser, and then you can have like eight or six or 10 or 12, multiple spaghetti tubings coming off of that. I don't, I don't use those myself because they're ugly. I don't want an octopus coming up out of my garden and trying to figure out where to go. Typically they're made for retrofits for a lawn system. They've got PVC pipe, rigid PVC. You got the riser. Generally, they're, they're, they were made originally for that. 
to screw right on there and go, oh, I've got drip emitters going out there. Um, it's, a, it's a shortcut. I, I, it'd be better to actually trench new main line than to use the rigid line, but that's just my opinion. So do whatever is right for you and your gardens. These are just things that have, have worked. A few things that have worked in my own gardens. I'm still learning. Yeah. So I have one spigot on the outside of the front of my house. Yep. Which is really old, so I don't have any of the other. Now, if I took one of those that you made and have multiple spigots on it, you know, so I could still have a hose. Yes. Would the pressure still be okay. Yeah, it would be fine. Because you're not okay. So she, what she's got. She's, she's got an older house, only has one, um, one spigot yeah. coming out the front. She's going, how do I use that for multiple valves? Does that, you get that right? Hose. And still have a hose. So the easiest way, if I just want to do flowers and vegetables, they make a Y that comes off, put this on one, mm -hmm. put the hose on the other. Boom, you're set. I've had one that had like four. Yes, they do actually make them where they come out with almost unlimited. They actually make clocks with unlimited. With like the, like a two valve, they got a switch. They're more complicated. You got to program A and then B over this way. Uh, but they actually make clocks for that too. But yes, you'd have unlimited pressure because you're not running all the valves at once. You're running zone A or one or two or three at separate times. Try not to have your valves running at the same time. Because all of a sudden you have 500 feet on this zone one. You get another 500 feet over here. You get 200 emitters here, two, 300 emitters over there, and all of a sudden you run them all at once. Um, you need to think through sequence of when I want things to water, so I'm not I'm not overlapping the same valve. Some clocks don't allow you to water at the same time. The more sophisticated clocks, they go, yeah, I know that's what you want to do, but we're not doing that. We're going to cycle it on. The second zone one goes off, we put zone two on. So it just depends on what what kind of clock you got. Um, I would say also, water early in the morning. Don't water midday. Plants do better if they're hydrated before the heat of the day, especially for fruits and vegetables. So you're gonna, you don't want them to be shriveling up, and then you go harvest those, and then you water. So you kind of want to water probably before 8 o'clock in the morning. So some of my trees, the trees and shrubs and stuff, they're watering two hours at a time. I've got eight valves. I might start watering trees for the week at 2 o'clock in the morning. Let it run for two hours. Okay, the next one comes on at 4. The next one comes at 6. The next one comes on at 8. By the time it's, it's starting to get warm, by 9 o'clock, it's starting to get hot in the peak of the season. Um, by then, we're all hydrated, we're done, and, and we're all set. The only negative with that is it's running when you're asleep. So you can't really see, is it running? Is it not running? How healthy are the plants? So that's where you do want to kind of cycle it, kind of eyeball it every once in a while. Yes? In the city of Prescott, you have, you cannot water between 8 at eight in the morning and 8 at night. Right, yeah. Yeah, the city of Prescott, you're supposed to water before 8, eight in the morning. Does that include this whole, the system, like the whole drip system? That includes all the irrigation. If you're in the city of Prescott, now, only a third of us are in the city of Prescott. The other parts are in the county, the other parts are from other cities. So it depends on the code. That's why I don't really spout code for this, because we're all from all over the place. But it is a good principle. We helped advise them on when, to, when those dates were. We just said, hey, why don't you make it from 8 to 8? It's easy to remember, and it's better for the plants. So the city kind of adopted that and just ran with it, which it is good to water. Don't be afraid of watering at night. I mean in the dark or morning dark here's the mistake my phoenix folks make they water at 10 o'clock at night eight o'clock at night because you know that's that's the best time it's still 100 degrees out at midnight in phoenix that's why we don't live there who lives 10 miles from the sun that's crazy here if you water at 10 o'clock at night those plants stay moist all night long they're not going to dry out like in phoenix we're not 100 degrees we're 60, even in the middle of the summer, it cools right down. So that water you put on there stays there, and it's the, the, the moisture gets on the foliage stays there, and all of a sudden you have mildew and leaf spot and, and mold issues. And so you're having problems with the plants. The plants will be healthier if you water closer to dawn. So they can stay wet for a couple hours. Don't let them stay wet from six o'clock all night long until the following day, that's when you have issues, especially during the monsoon season. 
you get afternoon rains, plus you watered. Uh, so that, that's that's something to watch as well. Water early morning as best you can, yes. When I lived in Phoenix, you always filled the water at night because the plants absorb water at night right. and they respirate during the day. Yes, correct. And if you water in the daytime, they aren't going to be absorbing it. That's correct. At night. That's because you're living on the surface of the sun. <laughs> that's You aren't doing that up here. This is God's country. You're at a much more beautiful layer. So, other, Toto, you're not in Kansas anymore. My other question, we're going to we're going to Prescott. Where we move, we've got some lavender plants. Yeah. And I can go out. And not, they're just you know hose water now. But you can go out and stick your finger down six inches, and they're dry like an hour later. Wow. Should yeah. I have to dig them up and put some organic material? Are we talking there? Phoenix or up here? Here, up here, lavender specific. So she got a lavender. And she puts her finger down and it's dry down below. Like an hour after you water. Should she add some, some organics or some, some polymer or something down there to keep it moist? With lavender, this is specific to lavenders, only lavenders. Most people kill lavender because they overwater it. So lavender to be dry, that's perfect. It's happy as can be. Let it dry out. Let it get bone dry. Let it start to weep and cry out for water before you give lavender water. Otherwise, they tend to have root rot. And they, they die off. Yeah. Most people root kill off their lavenders because they're up with wet. The soil's too bad. Yep. Yep. Trust me. But again, I can't tell you exactly how to water in your yard. What you'll find is the front yard's even different from the backyard. It, it changes. The soil type changes. I've seen water change from here. It's helped the gentleman. He couldn't believe it. He was from Chino Valley, killed one of his Austrian pines. He's blaming me. Let me tell you what you did. One's beautiful, 16 feet away, died. I go, oh, that's over water. No, it can't be. Okay, whatever. It's over watering. Pine trees die from over watering, especially when the monsoon rains are this much. And so that hole doesn't perk, doesn't drain as fast. As 16 feet away, this one perks, that one doesn't. You put too much water on that one, and, and it was okay on this one. So that one died, this one didn't. We're going to replace the plant for them, that's okay, but I want you to be smarter before so you don't kill the next one. So that, you just got to think, the holes change side by side, I've seen it. One rock shelf, one caliche layer, a hard calcium deposit, all of a sudden changes the drainage, so you're overwatering stuff. So. Kind of watch some of that kind of stuff plays into it. So I can get you close the back of that business card, tape it inside your irrigation box. It'll at least tell you when to cycle your system on, when to go to winter watering, when to go to, to other watering. Okay. And then kind of get you close on how much. Okay. Look for the PDFs, the, those uh, handouts. We'll go over details of all the distribution, how much, all the formulas. It'll tell you all of that stuff. But at least we got a one-on-one a -on -one time. With that, I'm going to say sayonara to all my folks on Facebook. Thank you for tuning in, and especially our well-watering folks. And then uh, the rest of you, if you want, you're welcome to leave. I will not take offense at all, but I thought it would take a small enough group we could walk about I'll show you some plants if you want, some th new things, that, some, some fall and winter things you plant now that do well. We can even talk how to water those things if you want. Very informal, okay? Thank you all. You clap. Go ahead.